Let's start again with week one, Paradigms of Learning. When we talked about the paradigms of learning, we said there are three conditions that make machine learning feasible. First, there must be a pattern. Secondly, we cannot pin it down mathematically, meaning it's hard to formalize. And third, the most important requirement is that we have data on it. Without data, we can't do any learning of any sort. So that is the most important requirement. We focused for the first 10 weeks of the course on supervised learning, where we have a data matrix and a column that indicates what the answers are for each instance. Here we can say there is a Y value that is the product of some unknown target function that takes X as an input and computes a function that gives our Y. We're going to get a data set that has pairs of this where x could be a vector and y could be some type of output, either a scalar value or some type of classification enumerated value. And our learning algorithm, script A, are going to be able to pick from its inventory of possible hypotheses or a hypothesis set a particular h that's going to best approximate f. We saw that PLA was one algorithm that could work under this regime, which we studied in much more detail later. And there was an important caveat that without having an idea of generalization, we wouldn't be able to learn a function because any function that we could learn from the data could take on any number of values outside of the domain of what we've seen in the training data. So we answered ourselves by thinking about what do we do next? If it's not possible to learn, what could happen? We answered that by looking at the simple idea of concept learning in which we introduced the idea of machine learning as a search, a search through a hypothesis set, which might be infinite in size but we studied it in the practical, finite possibility. We took a look at a case of concept learning through the space of conjunctive learning hypotheses, where we might have a conjunctive hypothesis of several scalar attributes or columns of X. Here, we're trying to learn the concept of drinking Singaporean drinks, such as kopi or te. We saw that without being able to generalize beyond the training instances, we wouldn't be able to predict any label as correlated to what we said on lecture one. So the idea of bias-free learning is just an impossibility. All learners must make a ontological commitment in bias in some form or another in terms of what hypothesis it can entertain. With concept learning, we looked at the candidate elimination algorithm, which was one way to embody a search. We said we would take a look at two different boundaries, a specific boundary, S, as well as a general boundary, G, which would enumerate the space of possibilities of hypotheses that could be consistent with the data that's been shown to the learner so far. We also mentioned the possibility of what's called active learning, where a learner, a supervised agent, could pull a source for the actual answers for specific queries. So for example, if I don't know that you like a particular drink, and that drink is going to help me narrow down the concepts somewhat akin to a game of 20 questions, then the active learner could pose that question to the oracle or somebody who can tell the answer why. And that can narrow down the hypothesis space by having it in some type of um, divide and conquer. In week three, we looked at naive Bayes and KNN. And we also did a linear algebra and probability review. For the, these two algorithms that fell outside of the mainstream of what we are going to pursue, 
we looked at naive Bayes as the first step. So naive Bayes is basically an algorithm that has two parts that are connoted by its name. Naive first means that we take an independence assumption between features, and that is represented by the data likelihoods, right? We're going to take all of the information about the inputs and factorize it into conditional independence assumptions for each individual attribute. The second part of naive Bayes is the Bayes, which says that we're going to estimate the posterior from the prior, which is our P of Y, and our likelihoods, which is our golden colored factorized naive independence um, conditionals. The marginals that we have are going to be taken out because we're just going to replace this with a uh, a, a constant of proportionality. So between all the different y's, we can still get an ordering among all of the probabilities, and that's good enough for us. We saw that in some cases, when there are parts of the factorized likelihoods that are not observed, we might get zero counts. And that, that would cause problems as all the probability estimates would collapse to zero. Therefore, we need to introduce smoothing to cater for these unseen types of data. And more generally, we see smoothing as a way of hallucinating data that, would might, that might make the actual machine learning in a data sample more regular and less likely to overfit. In the second half of this lecture in week three, we also covered KNN, which is an instance-based non-parametric learner. The idea is we vote for the nearest neighbors using a number K. And we saw that the larger the number of K used to make the decision, the smoother the boundaries. Here we can see an instance of 17 nearest neighbors, nine nearest neighbors, and one nearest neighbors. You can see how the border between the different classes gets smoother the more data we use. Finally, we also looked at the problem of the curse of dimensionality. This is the case where, especially in things like nearest neighbor, which uses similarity metric, the similarity metrics break down when there is not enough data to make a meaningful association between points at a distant case. This really happens a lot when we have very high dimensional data in which most of the data is actually going to end up far away. And we showed a simulation of that in the Python notebook. In week four, we looked at linear models. Linear models are the most simple models which use the signal, which is basically the weight vector times the actual data instance. We saw that classification can do this by taking the sign of this signal, positive weight. Positive weighted signals would equal a positive classification and vice versa, whereas regression would use the signal itself. In linear regression, we use the signal itself and look at the amount of penalty or loss, which we introduce as the J function between the estimated value minus its actual value squared. So this would give us the idea of a mean squared error that we could use to determine whether a particular regression solution is better than another. We also saw in the post lecture that there is a way to analytically solve this by using an inverted a matrix inverse, and that we could use the hat matrix or the pseudo inverse to actually calculate the weights in a one stop solution. We also, in the linear models, talked about nonlinear transforms, how we can use the linear model to affect a nonlinear boundary by first pre processing R space of X 
into a Z space where we use any type of function, mapping function phi, to preserve a linearity that would be eventually plotted through our linear learner. We saw that cost measures, the J's that we introduced earlier, should be created in such a way to be application specific. For example, things that require high precision could be modified in such a way as such that the loss function makes sure that the positive class is actually correctly classified most of the time. And that cases where we would need high recall would be given more weight to recall-based measures. For example, when we want to make sure that a problem of detecting people who might be affected by a pandemic disease could be caught, even though the cost of a false positive might be very low. Finally, we looked at the idea of a noisy target. The noisy target just says that the deterministic function of a target function could be converted into a spike function that would let us admit the possibility of y values being a probability distribution. Right? We could say that the correct value is actually smeared across a Gaussian noise and distributed with the mean value being the correct answer. With this idea, we can model noise in target functions very easily using a pr probabilistic notion. In the other half of week four, we also covered logistic regression. Logistic regression is the idea of using the linear signal, but mapping it to a probabilistic po uh, confidence value for positive or negative output. We saw that in logistic regression, which uses a separate cost function that penalizes an exponential loss of the difference between the sign of a point and the signal, that we would not get a case of a simple closed form solution, and that this cross entropy solution would need a case of solving through a iterative method, this method of gradient descent, right? So we saw this throughout the course where we could use a stochastic gradient descent to take steps in the opposite direction of the gradient. And the gradient is, of course, on the cost function, Rj. We saw several different ways to do gradient descent, but the most simple way is to take all the points to compute the gradient correctly for the entire data set and take a step in one direction that would minimize the cost function. However, we also investigated stochastic gradient descent, where we say that the average pointwise direction is actually equivalent to the grad gradient, such that we can use a single point to make an estimate of the gradient and use many iterations of a single point to approximate the entire gradient decision. And that would let us arrive at the same point as estimating over the whole gradient or the whole data set, but take this in a much faster time. In practicality, in a lot of neural network and other architectures, we use a batch size, a batch size that's between one, which would be SGD, all the way to M, which would be our normal batch gradient descent. Many times we actually decide the batch size dependent on the machine architecture that we're doing our machine learning on. In week five, our final week before the midterm, we covered bias variance and overfitting, one of the key parts of machine learning theory. Here we covered the bias variance trade-off and looked at how well the hypothesis space can approximate our overall F. We call this the bias, right? If our hypothesis set is fairly small, 
and far away from our target function, then the dis distance between the discrepancy between the hypothesis and the target function is large. We call this bias error. Secondly, we also looked at the variance. The variance measures how well a particular H that we can find within our script H could actually zoom in on the right one. So even if the hypothesis set that we have here might be very rich, and our target function is actually represented within it, the variance error tells us how much are we affected by our choice of data set. So each data set that we have could lead us to a different solution within the hypothesis set. And to find the correct target function then becomes a, uh, a function of whether the target data that we have actually leads us to the target function easily or not. We saw with the bias plus variance trade-off, we have a key component to try to understand the model complexity that we would like to create. And we said at the closing of the first half of this lecture that we want to make sure we match the model complexity to the data resources, meaning the quality and the quantity of the data, which will tell us what type of learning algorithm and how many parameters, or if you'd like, knobs, that we'd like to use in our model. In the second half of lecture, we tackled overfitting. Overfitting is the case of where we have data that is much more than what we can deal with. So in the data we have, we have both the signal that comes from our function as well as the noise that comes from both bias error as well as variance error as well as stochastic noise. So when we are trying to fit a model to the data, we have to make sure that we have to match the data resources and make sure we choose a model that fixes this uh, proportion well. If we have a model with too many parameters, we'll be able to fit not only the signal, but also additionally the noise, which can cause very, very bad fit for non-training data, right? Basically on the test data or in production.